All right, very good. So it is my pleasure and my honor to welcome you for the afternoon session or early evening session here in Europe. Um, it's, uh, the first speaker will be uh, Stefano Marsilia. Uh, Stefano works in, at Utrecht University in the Netherlands, and he will talk about computing isomorphism classes of abelian varieties of refinite fields. Stefano, the Zoom floor is yours. Thank you. I'll share my screen. And it's full screen. Okay. Um, well, yes, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to give this talk. So um, I will talk about uh, computing isomorphism classes of abelian varieties of a finite field. So the, the goal of this talk is to give an overview of various algorithms and various cases where we can actually produce some representatives, in some sense, of the isomorphism classes of abelian varieties, which are going to be defined over fine fields. And sometimes also, well, actually quite often, also with some extra structure they might have, like polarizations. OK. So even if the goal of this talk is to talk about abelian varieties over finite fields, let me start with abelian varieties over the complex numbers, both because it's an easier case, so it's a nice warm up, but also because they're going to play an important role later on, even when we're going to move to finite fields and support these characteristics. So let A be an abelian variety of dimension G over the complex numbers. We know that its group of points is a torus. So it can be described as a G-dimensional complex vector space modulo a lattice, so a free abelian group of finite rank, precisely of rank twice the dimension. Not every torus is an abelian variety, but only the torus that admit a non-degenerate Riemann form. Indeed, this guarantees that the torus is, of, is coming from a, a projective variety. It's actually algebraic. It's not just a manifold. And this Riemann form actually has something to do with what we uh, call the polarization of the abelian variety. In some sense, it tells you how the abelian variety is embedded inside the projective space. So it's some data that we are very interested in. And one of the reasons we are interested in is that, well, it's related to the main topic of this conference, namely curves. Indeed, every curve, every smooth proper curve over a field can be associated to an abelian variety called the Jacobian variety, which comes with a principal polarization, a canonical principal polarization. And this is something that people do. So they study the Jacobian associated to the curve to actually study the curve itself. In this talk, we're not going to talk about Jacobian set curve, but we're going to focus on the abelian variety side. So let's continue with complex abelian varieties. So this association from the abelian variety and the torus is actually stronger than what I just said. Namely, we have an equivalence between the categories of abelian varieties over C and category of complex tori. So admitting such a Riemann form as I just talked about. So in particular, we can associate to every abelian variety a lattice. So we can forget about C to the power G. That's not so interesting, but we are going to focus on the lattice. And this lattice is actually the first integral homology of the abelian variety. OK. In characteristic B, so in positive characteristic, such an equivalence cannot exist. Indeed, there are objects like super singular elliptic curves, which have quaternionic endomorphism algebra. So already in dimension one, we have some problem. Uh, the reason why such an equivalence can exist is, is that if, by contradiction, there were such an equivalence, then we would get a two-dimensional representation where the dimension is considered over the rational numbers of a quaternionic algebra. And we know that such algebras cannot have a two-dimensional representation. So there is an intrinsic obstruction to have an equivalence like this over the whole category of abelian varieties of some field of positive characteristics. Nevertheless, over finite fields, we can get some analogous results to the one over the complex number that is here on the slide when we restrict ourselves to, to some subcategory of the or some subcategory of the category of abelian varieties. Okay, let's move on. So before digging into the classification up to isomorphism, we are, um, we are going to talk about a coercive classification. So namely a classification up to isogeny. So recall that an isogeny is a surjective map between two abelian varieties of the same dimension. And in particular, it has finite 
So it can be thought as a generalization of the notion of isomorphism. In particular, isomorphisms of isogenies of degree one, so when the kernel is there. Over a finite field, uh, this classification is carried over and is completely determined by the Frobenian endomorphism of the Vignan variety, or better, its characteristic polynomial. So in this slide, I'm going to recall what is usually referred to as Honda Day theory, and mainly to fix the notation. So when you have an Abelian variety in positive characteristic, it comes with a Frobenius endomorphism, a Frobenius map. In particular, if the field is finite, this map can be made into an endomorphism by composing the relative Frobenius. This map acts on the, on the fine charts as taking p powers. So it's really what you have in positive characteristics. This Frobenius induces an action on every elliptic state module associated with the Abelian variety for every prime different L different from the characteristic. And the elliptic state module is a pre CL module of rank 2G. So, in particular, this action, this map that can be represented by a matrix once one chooses a basis. And when we have a matrix, we can take its characteristic polynomial. And I'm going to denote the characteristic polynomial of the Frobenius endomorphism by the letter H, H of S. This is a Q veil polynomial. So it's a polynomial with the integer coefficients of degree twice the dimension, of course, because it's a dimension, it's a determinant over a, two to the, a, a free module of rank to the power G. And it's also a Q veil. So this means that all the complex roots of this polynomial have absolute value equal to square root of Q. Okay, so integer coefficient, degree twice the dimension, roots of complex absolute values. Moreover, it is an isogeny variant. So two abelian varieties that are isogenous will have the same characteristic polynomial. But more is true. Indeed, on the state proved that they, they proved together that the association from uh, isogeny classes of abelian varieties of Q to the characteristic polynomial is injective. So two abelian varieties are exogenous if and only if the same have the same characteristic polynomial of Frobenius. Moreover, this association is also, also almost surjective. With this, I mean that if you make a list of all the characteristic polynomial of Frobenius of a fixed degree, let's say degree 2G, then up to removing a few of them according to a very explicit rule, you get that all the remaining ones are characteristic polynomial of Frobenius. So you can enumerate all abelian varieties up to isogeny just using this q veil polynomial. Of course, by the very, the very definition, the, the number of q veil polynomials of a fixed degree is finite because well, the, the roots are all have complex absolute values to so q. So the coefficients being symmetric polynomials and so the roots must live inside certain finite boxes. So there is only finitely many of them once you fix the degree and of course the field. Okay, so we can list all the billion varieties of isogeny using this, square, this characteristic polynomial. Moreover, we have that such a characteristic polynomial is square free, where I mean that it doesn't have uh, multiple roots. Uh, if and only if the endomorphism algebra of the billion variety or equivalent to the endomorphism ring is commutative. So this is something that is, we're going to be interested a lot in square free characteristic polynomials, so this is nice to keep in mind. Okay, let's move on and let's start looking at a more refined classification, not just after isogeny, but after isomorphism. We are going to get closer to after isomorphism. So, one of the big results that we are going to use in describing, uh, in building our algorithm is this theorem by Delin. So, Delin proved an equivalence between a subcategory of the categories of the varieties as some explicit thing that I'm going to just describe you like in a second. But he focused on abelian varieties that are called ordinary. So an abelian variety over a Q is ordinary if half of the roots of its characteristic polynomial, so half of the piadic roots are piadic units, exactly half of them. There are other equivalent definitions. For example, uh, this happens if and only if the mid coefficient of the characteristic polynomial, so the coefficient of x to the power g, is co-prime with the characteristic of the field. And, uh, or otherwise, an abelian variety is ordinary if and only if it has maximal p torsion. So the p torsion, the, p, the point scaled by p, are the form of a group isomorphic to z to the power 
P to the power of G, to the power G, which is the maximum of the problem. As the name suggested, they are the general case. So if you pick a random abelian variety in any meaningful way, in meaningful way this is going to be ordinary. Or more precisely, in terms of the modular space, the ordinary locus is the biggest subspace, so the biggest stratum of this modular space. But let's go to the link theory. So the lean in 69 proved that there exists an equivalence between the category of ordinary billion variety of Q and the category of pairs T and F, where T is a lattice of even rank and F is an endomorphism of this lattice, so a Z linear map that satisfies the following axioms. So it's semi-simple. The roots of its characteristic polynomial all have complex absolute values for root of Q. Half of the half of the periodic roots are periodic units, and there exists an endomorphism going in the opposite direction, such that the composition with this f, or better, both composition are just multiplication by q. Okay, so yeah, let me tell you what the functor is, the functor that induces this equivalence, because we'll make everything a lot clearer. So ordinary abelian varieties are particular because they admit what is called a canonical list. So there exists an abelian varieties living over the bit vectors of Q, so in characteristic zero, that reduces to A, that's a list, and has all the, auto, um, the endomorphism. So the canonical lifting has the same endomorphism ring as the abelian variety over the final. So this is very special because in particular, as we said, the abelian variety over Q has an aprobinous endomorphism. And now we have an abelian variety, characteristic zero, with also a map that reduces to the provenius. So this is tenth mesh. Something in characteristic zero with the provenius map. All right. So what is now the functor? Well, T of A is going to be the first homology of the complex abelian variety. So you extend the base field of this canonical lifting to the complex. Numbers, and you take the first integral homology. As I said, this abelian variety has a Frobenius map, and f of a is going to be exactly the Frobenius, the induced Frobenius. Okay, so we have a complex abelian variety with a map that reduces the Frobenius. Then we take the homology, it's tutorial, so we also keep this map, and we have an equivalent. So this is the first a lattice and a Frobenius endomorphism. So this is very similar to what we have seen over the complex numbers. Right, we are taking our abelian variety and associating it to a lattice. And here we are doing the same. And in, moreover, we need to keep track of this for All right, so this is the Linux theorem. Um, yeah, so the map V, just a couple of remarks about the axioms. Well, we are seeing that the characteristic polynomial of this F uh, is a cubic polynomial. This is not surprising. Half of them are periodic units, just means that we are looking at ordinary abelian varieties. And the map V is going to be the version. The Frobenius has this other result, other spectral results in this direction. All right, let's move on. So now we are going to focus, we are going to use this theorem, this Leibniz theorem, this can, this big theorem, into a special case, in a special case, which is the square free case. So we fix a characteristic polynomial of Frobenius, which is ordinary and square free. Okay? And this will give us an isogeny class C of H, which is a a C of H. Every abelian variety in this isogeny class is going to be isogenous to a product of simple pairwise non isogenous abelian varieties. So, this is what square free means in, terms, in geometric terms. We define K to be the etal algebra generated by this polynomial H, and F is going to be a root of H inside K. So observe that since we are assuming it's square free, this polynomial is not just the characteristic polynomial of the provision, but it's also the minimal polynomial of the provision. So that's why we can identify its root inside K with the provisions in the same way. So this algebra is an etal algebra. So it's a product of number fields, finite product of number fields. And the number fields are going to be the fields generated or defined by the uh, irreducible factors of this H. And let's be the, the Q over F. So Shibun. Then the equivalence uh, proved by Deline induces the following. So induces an equivalence between the category of abelian varieties of Q inside this isogeny class C of H and the category of fractional ideas over the order generated by Frobenius and Shibun. So fractional ideas leave it in K. So the maps in the category above are homomorphisms of abelian varieties of Q. 
and the maths in the, the bottom category are linear morphisms, so ZFD linear morphisms, okay? So this is an equivalence of category. And when you take isomorphisms above and below, you get a bijection, all right? So we have a bijection between the isomorphism classes inside the isogeny class and the set, well, or, and the monoid of the ideal classes of this order ZFD. So indeed, even two fractional ideals, you can multiply them and you're gonna get a new fractional ideal. And so it's a monoid, it's a community monoid. And we are gonna denote it by ICM, ideal plus one. All right, and this is gonna be our, well, the, the guy that we want to compute. Right? If we can compute these fractional ideals after isomorphism, we have the isomorphism classes as well. But here the first problem comes, which is that this order can very well be non be non-maximal order. So it can be a product of uh, can be the product of variable integers, but also can be singular, can be different from this order, can be smaller than that. So there might be non-invertible ideas that we have to consider and learn how to. So in the next few slides, I'm gonna tell you how to compute this idea class on I'm gonna give you an algorithm. And uh, this algorithm works for every order, not just the order ZFD. So R is gonna be any order in an exact algebra of SD for the moment, for the next three slides. Uh, recall just the definition that the two fractional ideals, I and J are isomorphic as fractional ideal, so as our, as our modules, if and only if there exists a non-zero divisor of the entire algebra that sends one ideal into the other by multiplication. So xi is equal to j. And inside the ideal class monoid, we have a subgroup. So the subgroup defined consisting of the invertible fractional ideals up to our linear isomorphism. So recall that an ideal is invertible, an ideal i is invertible if there exists another ideal j, such that the multiplication of the two is the idea generated by one, if the ideal is R. This is an equality if and only if every ideal is invertible. And this happens if and only if the order is actually the maximal order of the algebra. It's the product of the ring of integers of the number two. All right, but we can actually prove more. We can prove that the, the ideal class monoid contain the union of all the Peter group over where the disjunct the union is taken over all the over orders of R. So all the rings that contain R and then are contained in the maximal order. Indeed, an ideal is in, if it's an ideal is invertible, it's invertible in one of these rings, and so and only one. So the union is this joint. And of course, every invertible S ideal is going to be also an R module. So it's a fractional R ideal. So they have the inclusion. In general, we have an equality. So this happens if and only if the order is bus. I'm going to say more about bus rings later on during the talk, but it's not always the case. And we want an algorithm that handles all the cases, all ideas plus monoids, even when we have non-invertible ideas. And I'm going to describe this algorithm in a second. Let me just mention that here, I mean, we need to compute the lattice of the overorders, and this has been done by Tommy Hoffman and Carlos Kekana in our paper in 2019. So they come up with an algorithm that, that works very well in practice. They work you by um, they proceed by computing first the minimal overorders of R and then proceeding by recursion. And the minimal overorders are easier to understand. They reduce the problem to some linear algebra over time. Okay, so we want the algorithm that handles also the ideas that are really not invertible. So not just not invertible in R, but also not invertible in every overorder. And the way to do it is to study the, the isomorphism problem locally. So but we follow the work of Dave Tarski and Tarsenal, who were quite old from 1962. Uh, they introduced the notion of weak equivalence. So two fractional ideas are weakly equivalent if and only if they are isomorphic locally at every prime. So after localizing at every prime. They also prove that this is the same as having one, so the unit element of the algebra, inside the product of the two inverse colon ideas. So I colon J and J colon. And this is great from a computational point of view because given generators, let's say a Z basis of I and a Z basis of J, then we can easily compute the colon idea. We can easily compute the product of the colon idea and we can easily check if one is inside this product. So in other words, we can easily check on a computer if two ideas are weakly equivalent. And this is great. As the name suggests, it's a weak equivalent. It's an equivalence relation. And let WR be the set of the weak equivalence classes. 
The representatives of all the weak equivalence classes can be found in the finite set of the sub R modules of the finite quotient OK module, the conductor of the order R. So, in other words, for every fractional ideal I, there exists an ideal which is weak equivalent to I that is contained inside the maximal order and then contains the conductor. So, in other words, it can be identified with such a sub module. This quotient, OK, module the conductor is finite because the conductor is a fractional ideal, so it's a lattice inside OK, and most of the time is not too big. So let me just say one word that this method of computing the weak equivalence classes is not the fastest that we know. There are some slightly more refined ideas, methods, but they all rely on the idea of reducing, at looking at a finite quotient and then looping over all the representatives there. So even if this algorithm works pretty well when the order is not too singular or when the, the algebra is not too big, this is still the bottleneck of the algorithm. So there is, if someone has some new ideas, this would be great. All right, so, but let's assume for the purpose of this talk that we can compute the weak equivalence class. So that this algorithm is a thing. Let's move on and let's go to the isomorphism classes. So we understand the local isomorphism classes and we want to understand the global isomorphism classes. So we partition both the set of weak equivalence classes and the ideal class monoid with respect to the multiplicator ring. So a multiplicator ring is the set of elements of K that sends one ideal inside itself. So it's the colon ideal I colon I. It's the endomorphism ring of the ideal. This is clearly an invariant of both the isomorphism class and the weak equivalence class. And with this notation, we can state the main theorem, the, the main core of the algorithm that says that for every other order, the picker group, so the group of invertible ideals of S, acts freely on the set of isomorphism classes with that multiplicator, because Clyde multiplicator is equal to S. And the set of weak equivalence classes with that multiplicator ring is the quotient by this action. Since the action is free, we just need representative of the weak equivalence classes, representative of the invertible ideals, multiply all of them in every possible way, and we get all the isomorphism classes with that multiplicator. Now, repeat this process for every other order, and we get the whole ideal class. So we know how to compute isomorphism classes of invertible ideals of an order, even if they are not free. Great. So let's sum up very briefly. We started with an ordinary square free QVL polynomial H. We reduced the problem to computing ideal classes, and we have an algorithm to do that. So we have an algorithm to compute the isomorphism classes of abelian varieties inside a square free ordinary hydrogen class. Correct. But we can actually get a lot more. So since this algorithm, this theory, is based on, a, on an equivalence of categories, everything that can be described pictorially, we can, we can actually compute. And one thing that uh, we are very, very interested in is the concept of polarization, so how to compute the polarization to one abelian variety. And that's what we're going to discuss now. So in 1995, Howe published a paper, which I think was based on his PhD thesis, where he described what the dual variety and what a polarization is in the category, in the Delis category, the target category of the Delis equivalent, so the category of these pairs. Uh, I'm not going to say what are those in the Delin's category? I'm just going to give you the translation into this fractional ideal world. So let H our ordinary square free polynomial as before, and A an abelian variety inside the exogeny class, and I be the ideal, the fractional ideal corresponding to it. Then the dual variety corresponds to the trace dual of the fractional ideal I with a bar on top. So the bar is the CM uh, involution of the algebra. So the algebra K is a CM algebra. But I'm going to the finite fields as complex multiplication. And the trace dual consists just of all the elements that sense the ideal inside the integer after applying the trace, the trace from k to q, the normal trace. A polarization mu of the abelian variety A corresponds to a non zero divisor of the algebra that sends the ideal inside its dual, of course, right? It has to be an isogeny from the abelian variety to its dual. And that is totally imaginary and phi positive. So, totally imaginary and phi positive are the translation of the symmetries that a Riemann form has to satisfy into this world of uh, fractional ideas. And in particular, phi is a, a CM type of the algebra K that satisfies the Shimura Taniyama. And it's very important because it uh, can be thought as what induces a complex structure on the canonical list. 
or better, the complex structure coming from the finite field or of the canonical list. So the canonical list, as I said, we can send it into a complex abelian variety once it is an embedding of the list vector inside C. And then this is a torus, but this torus might have more than one complex structure. And we want the one uh, that comes from positive characteristic. And this is identified by this CM class. Okay. Uh, moreover, we get the degree of a polarization is uh, uh, the degree of polarization is just the size of the co-kernel of this multiplication by lambda. And uh, moreover, if A mu is a principal polarization, it's a principal polarized abelian variety, and I lambda is the corresponding element, fractional ideal with element of K, then we have that all the non isomorphic principal polarizations of A correspond bijectively to the totally positive unit of the endomorphism ring of A modulo the unit of the form B bar. So this bijection is simply obtained by chasing the, di the diagrams that we get. So translating the notion of automorphism of a polarized abelian variety into this fractional ideal work, and you get this quotient. All right, and also in the same way, one gets that the automorphism group of a principally polarized abelian variety corresponds to the torsion units of S, of, where S is the endomorphism ring of the abelian variety. All right. So let's just write this idea into an algorithm. So we have an algorithm to enumerate principal polarizations up to isomorphism, and this goes as follows. So first you compute an element, any isomorphism between the fractional ideal and its dual. If this element doesn't exist, then the abelian variety is not such dual, so it cannot be principally polarized. We can just ignore it. Then we loop over all the representatives of the finite quotient units modulo this unit of the form DV bar. So we take u to be a unit inside, and we work over all the causes of this finite quotient. And we construct the element lambda i0 u. If this element is totally imaginary, by positive there we found one principal polarization. And by the bijection that we've seen in the previous slides, then we have all principal polarizations up to isomorphism. Okay? So we have an algorithm to compute all principal polarizations. Moreover, this algorithm I and mean, the theorem that said that before can be modified to compute also polarizations of any degree. But uh, for sake of brevity, I'm not going to go into it. Okay, so we understand how to compute principal polarization in a um, square free case. And now I'm going to just give you um, an example because when you claim that you have an algorithm, you better have a, some computed example. So we take uh, a characteristic polynomial of degree eight. And it is ordinary because the mid coefficient is co-prime with the characteristic of the field, which is free. And this corresponds to an isogeny class of simple ordinary Binion varieties over a free of dimension four. It's simple because the polynomial is irreducible, one can verify it. Let f be a root of h, as we have with the usual notation we established already, and r be the order generated by Frobenius and by Shibun. There are eight overorders of r, two of them are not Gorenstein. So they, there are some ideas that are not invertible in their own in their own endomorphism ring. Nevertheless, we can compute the ideal class monoid. There are 18 isomorphism classes inside this isogeny class, so 18 isomorphism classes of the variety. Five of them are outside the disjoint union of the picker group, so they are really not invertible. Eight classes admit a principal polarization, so two of them admit more than one. So we have 10 isomorphism classes of, of principally polarized the variety. Okay, uh, let me give you a couple of them. So the first one, well, Can this is a question. Yeah. Could you say again what the, what the significance of those orders not being Gorenstein was? Uh, so uh, simply because, of, so an order is Gorenstein if and only if the isomorphism classes with multiplicator ring equal to that order are all invertible. So if the okay. order is not Gorenstein, there will be more isomorphism classes with that multiplicator ring. So in a sense, uh, the order R is not bus, and we are in one of these harder cases. OK, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so this example, yeah. So here is a Z basis, uh, not very pretty, but very explicit. There are these isomorphism class gives us two principal polarizations after isomorphism, this element x11 and x12. The endomorphism ring of this uh, abelian variety is uh, uh, the smallest one, so it's the order generated by Frobenius and Bershibun. And the two principally polarized abelian varieties both have only two automorphisms. Now let's look at another ideal. Again, two phases. 
this one has only one principal polarization, the endomorphism ring is bigger. It's not just the order generated by Frobenius in the tribum. Again, only two isomorphic classes. And I picked these two ideas because one is invertible in its own multiplicator ring and its own endomorphism ring, and the other one is not. So even if it is principally polarizable. So the notion of antivirity seems to be not related to being invertible or not. Okay. There is another case that we understand well, that is the case of uh, where the, poly the characteristic polynomial is a pure power. So it's of the form g to the power r, where g is square free and of course ordinary, because again, we want to use this delinquent. In this case, we have that every abelian variety in isogenous class determined by g to the power a is isogenous to a pure power, where b belongs to the isogenous class determined by the square free polynomial. If we call R to be the order generated by Frobenius and Bershibum, so in this case, F is a root of G. G is the minimal polynomial of the Frobenius, and KG is going to be the algebra generated by G. Then under this assumption, the Lin's theorem induces the following equivalence. So abelian varieties in the exogenous class CG to the power of R, and R modules M that live inside the product of R copies of this algebra KG. Okay. Um, Recall that now we're going to need to use this notion of bus. So recall that an order is bus if and only if all its other orders are going time. Or equivalent that we have seen if the ideal class monoid is equal to the disjoint union of the picker group. So every fractional ideal is invertible in its own multiplication. Example, quadratic orders are bus. So whenever we are looking at an isogeny cluster of powers of ellipticals, we fall into these cases, for example. But there are also bus orders that are not quadratic. So there is plenty of that. In some sense, this is maybe the general case, but I don't really have a proof. But Bass studied Gorenstein order in the paper called Ubiquity of the Gorenstein Rings. And well, Ubiquity of then means that most of them are Gorenstein. <laughs> and then also Bass must be a general notion, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if this is a good argument, but definitely gives the idea. OK, but let's use this assumption that the order R is Bass. So if R is bus, the modules that we have, we have above, so these uh, modules inside KG to the power R, are all isomorphic to a direct sum of fractional ideal. So they mm -hmm. all split. So let's write it in terms of uh, abelian varieties. So we have a bijection between the, abelian, the isomorphism classes of the abelian varieties in this isolation class and direct sum of R fractional ideal. And moreover, we have a classification. So two such decomposition, two such direct sum are isomorphic if and only if, uh, to reordering the fractional ideas in the direct sum. They have the same multiplicator ring and the product class. So when you take the product of I1 times I2 times IR and the product of the other decomposition are the same, are isomorphic. So this gives a complete classification and also tells us that it's very easy to compute the isomorphism class in such a isogeny class. Great. Let's deduce immediately a corollary since we have it. So we know that an abelian variety in such an isogenous class is isogenous to a pure power, but actually we have proved that an such an abelian variety is going to be isomorphic to a product of abelian varieties in the square free isogenous class. Because if the module splits, then the abelian variety must split as well. This is an equivalent of categories. And uh, so everything is a product. So the results that I mentioned before by Everett Howe uh, on polarizations carry over also in this case. But the algorithm that I described before in the square free case, it's in, gen in general as explained, doesn't work. Indeed, uh, we are going to have to look at quotients where they, there are actions of groups, but they are a group of matrices. So they are not commutative, and it's harder to simplify. Nevertheless, the case of powers of an ordinary elliptical has been solved by Kirschman, Alboris, and Sader, and Robert well, last year. And I guess this is going to be part of the talk discussed in the next talk, and it's happening in the next talk. So stay tuned. All right. How am I doing with the time? I think I better speed up a little bit, so I'm going to skip this example. Uh, and let's move to outside the ordinary local. So um, we have used so far the theorem by Deline, but there is another equivalence of categories that I, well, that I enjoy a lot, because it's very similar to the Deline's one, and namely is this theorem by Chantelega and Stephen. So if you look at it at the first glance, you immediately see that it's very similar. So we have an equivalence between a category of abelian varieties over some finite field and category of pairs where C is a module, F is an endomorphism, and a bunch of axioms. The differences are that they are only looking at abelian varieties over the prime field of P, 
and they are considering isogeny classes with, where the characteristic polynomial doesn't have real root. So they are just excluding this real root, which is a tiny portion of isogeny classes. Only very few isogeny classes are going to have real root. And the same, the axioms are exactly the same, except that the ordinary condition is the swap with this no real roots, and q is going to be equal to p in the statement. Otherwise, the statement is the same. The factor on the other end is completely different. Indeed, the, the, the Linz functor was going through canonical lifting, and now we cannot lift anymore because we are going to also consider isogeny classes that are not ordinary. And indeed, the functor goes as follows. So the lattice is going to be a home set between our abelian variety and an abelian variety w that satisfies a minimality condition. So it says its characteristic polynomial is the same root as the characteristic polynomial of A, but it's square free. And among all these abelian varieties in this square free isogeny class, we take the one with minimal endomorphism ring, which is going to be our order ZFP, our prime. And F is the induced problem. So as you can see, the functor is quite different. For example, this one is contravariant, while the least functor was covariant. So it's already quite a difference. Nevertheless, the target category is the same. And this means that everything that I told you so far about isomorphism classes works exactly in the same way. So we get fractional ideas, we get the direct sum of fractional ideas from the power of our state, and the algorithms that I told you, they all work in the same way. As long as we are like in this set of hypotheses and we remember that we can only consider a mutagenic classes of LSP. Okay. There are other functors that I just want to briefly mention. I'm not going to use them in this talk. So Oswald and Shankar uh, produce an, an, a functor, an equivalence, which is very similar to the Linz one. It goes through canonical lifting for almost all the abelian varieties. Abelian varieties could be ranked G minus one. And uh, we have, uh, with Verstam and Karemacher, we have done some small generalization to this functor. So they, they work with simple abelian varieties, we end up square free. Then there is there are a bunch of functors or description that work with the powers of elliptic curves, like work of Serre, work of Kani, and then the many of his paper, Jordan, Stephen Kuhn, and Range of Baron Tatum. And I think these are going to be discussed later during this week in the third fourth talk. Uh, as I said, I'm not going to use this here. So I'm going to focus on the chain telegram six factor. So as I said, we understand the isomorphism classes. But what about the polarization? Well, the results of how do not immediately apply, because as I already said a few times, we cannot lift canonically each abelian variety in this isogeny class. So we need a new strategy. And that's what we did with the Jana Ferstam and Valentin Kremacher in our preprint that came out this year. So we consider a square free isogeny class over a Q. So we, are, we want to use the Chantalic as six functor, but what I'm going to say in this precise slide works, works over any finite field. So for a moment, let Q be any, any power of a class. So let K be the et al algebra generated by F as usual. And Chai, Corrin, and Org come up with this notion of residual reckless condition. So a CN type of K, CN type phi of K, satisfies the residual reckless condition if. One satisfies the Shimura Taniyama formula. That's cool. We want something that has to do with the variety, so Shimura Taniyama better hold. And second, the residue field of the reflex field of this CN type is, can be embedded inside a few. It can be realized as a subfield of a few, so it's small enough. If this is true, they prove that inside the isogeny class, there exists an abelian variety that admits a canonical lifting. So we can lift canonically up to exogeny. So this is the motto. There is one that you can lift. Cool. And our strategy is uh, to compute polarization is that if we can compute the polarization of this abelian variety A that we can lift canonically to characteristic zero, then we can spread them to the wall as a class. And the way to do it is going to be described in this slide where there is a diagram. So now we want to use the chain telegram six functor. So again, we move back to P. Uh, let's assume that A is an abelian variety admitting a canonical lifting to characteristic zero. Um, A. So we have the home set of the abelian variety from A to its viewer. The polarizations are going to live inside the home set, right? So it's natural that we look at it. Then we consider the analogous home set of the canonical lifting, and we can use complex uniformization to describe this home set as a colon ideal between two fractional ideas, so I and uh, its dual, I bar T. So this is all about happening in the complex field. So it's just tori. So these are the lattices that you look at. Now we apply the 
Chente legacy x factor, which I denote by a g, and we get another colon ideal. It turns out that this colon ideal is equal to the one coming from complex uniformization. But the reduction mass is going to be a multiplication by some unit of the endomorphism ring of A, some element alpha. OK, now we understood how to open the jar of gem, and let's spread it everywhere. So we take F an isogeny between an abelian variety, this abelian variety A, and any other abelian variety in the isogeny class. And we look at its onset between B and B dual. Again, we want the polarization of B. That's the goal. This F is going to induce a map from these two onsets on B B dual, on A A dual. Then again, we apply the functor G. And then this F star is going to correspond to a map G of F star. So we understand the polarizations of A inside of this complex world. And now, in order to translate this notion into polarization, to this polarization into polarization, so here we are going to have to apply alpha and this element to GF star. So GF star is no problem because it corresponds to a multiplication by an element of GF and GF bar. So GF bar corresponds to F dual, and this is going to be F. And this is a totally real and totally positive element. So it sends total imaginary elements to total imaginary elements and five positive elements to five positive elements. So it doesn't change the notion of polarizations in the complex world. So the only problem is this alpha, this reduction map. So in our paper, I um, cannot give details because it will take another talk, but in our paper, we study when we can pretend that alpha is equal to one. So when assuming that alpha is equal to one, we get still a set that is in bijection with a set of principal polarizations of isomorphism of any abelian variety B in the isogeny class. And we write down a bunch of uh, conditions where this holds true, and we run it our algorithm on a bunch of uh, on all the isogeny classes for small finite fields for dimension two, three, and I think uh, there's also some computation for four. And in practice, it turns out to happen most of the time. So most of the time, we can pretend that alpha is equal to 1. But in general, there are some isogeny classes where we can only get partial data. So we can only get pretend that alpha is equal to 1 for certain isomorphism classes inside the isogeny class, not the way isogeny class. So the story is not entirely complete. But still, it works very well. All right. Final slide, a few commercials for you. So the technology that I explained in this talk that I presented to you can be also used to study base field extension and proofs of abelian varieties in the ordinary case in this case, because we cannot use the chain telegraph six functor because this one works only over a field. So of course, you cannot extend the base field and hope to get back to this figure. Um, we can also compute period matrices of the canonical lift of the complex canonical lift of abelian varieties, again, in the ordinary Case. Very recently, with Kalex Klimber, we applied this technology to study the group of points and build the results of how and to Glaya, again, a very recent thing. We proved that every finite abelian group occurs as a group of points of an ordinary abelian variety over F2. So, about this, I think it's interesting to wait. I'm very excited for the talk that Van Lin is going to give later this week, because they're going to give a generalization of this how and the paper to some other finite fields, not just the two. And well, our proof, the, the, our contribution, the contribution by Taleb and me, also applies. We believe that it applies also to what Van Lin is going to say, so I'm very excited. Final thing, so all the algorithms that are described are implemented in Magnum, and they are available in the GitHub, and uh, with help from but researchers from the Simons collaboration, we have been running for computations for quite a while now, and we plan to publish the results of the isomorphism classes in the next All right. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Stefano. We may unmute and clap. Other yeah. questions for the speaker? Remarks? You may write in the chat if you want. You've seen already there's a comment by Drew Sutherland from the middle of the talk. Gives you the link to LMFDB where you can check. Oh, thank you. The implementation has been used for. So I, I have a little question, maybe a bit te technical. So you, you use to get the, the lifting 
they do canonical lifting, you use this uh, um, criteria on, on the reflex field. So you ask that the reduction is in F cube. Yeah. What happens if it's not? Yeah, so if it is not, I mean, you, there exists still an abelian variety that is going to be the canonical lifting of some of the field extension of that abelian variety. So you might leave a cube. So the chai current door prove that, uh, yeah, that can happen. So if this residue field is too big, then you might need a field extension. And well, that's a problem, of course, for us because it breaks our result at the moment and we don't know how to start to fill this gap, but we're working on it. Thank you. Other remarks? <laughs> Sorry, I mean, we have a problem because Christoph and me, we are in the same room, so we didn't agree who has the microphone on, whatever. <laughs> I have a question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> question, Stefano, that can you please go to the page 12 of your slide? So, I mean, it's the beginning of your example, and you saw some numbers. Uh, yeah. But there is something that I don't understand because you have. 18 isogeny classes? No, 18 isomorphism classes. Ah, sorry, isomorphism classes? Yeah, there. Uh, here, yeah. So but, inside these isogeny classes, there are 18 isomorphism classes of abelian varieties. Yeah, but you say five, they are not invertible, eight admit a principal polarization. Yeah. But why did you say that you have 10 isomorphism classes of principal polarization of abelian varieties? I mean, what so, is so, ab so of these 18 isomorphism classes, 10, okay, 10 do not admit a principal polarization. So 10 are not principally polarized. Eight of them admit a principal polarization, but actually two of them admit more than one. Oh, that was a So thing. there are two isomorphism classes with two principal polarization each, if I remember correctly. And one of them is the one that I show in the, this slide. So this one has two principal polarization. And then there is another one with two principal polarization, then uh, some others that have only one, and then a bunch of them which do not have a principal quality. Okay, thank you, Ramit. That well makes done. sense. <laughs> As I have the microphone on. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> I jump in. Uh, so computationally wise, where are we standing now? I mean, what can you reach like uh, in genius and, uh, and fields? So the point is that this algorithm don't really depend on the genus. So they work uh, in the same way for dimension four and for a much higher dimension. Of course, they're going to be slower because we have like number fields or etal algebras which are bigger. So every z basis is going to be bigger. So, but I think that cannot be avoided. But the bottlenecks and the, the math behind this algorithm, from a theoretical point of view, they work in the same way. Uh, so in that sense, I mean, we can go to very high dimension. It's just that the, well, there are too many isogeny classes to make a complete list. Uh, that's one obstacle, of course. But if you give me one isogeny class, even a completely big dimension, and if the order R is not too far away from the maximal order, then I can compute you the, the isomorphism class. Of course, this is assuming that we are in the square free case or in the power of a bus. So there are the other cases, the mixed cases that are not really, we, I still don't know how to compute the module. Uh, that's like how to compute the isomorphism classes of the modules that will come from the Deline equivalent. Uh, and the same holds true for like the pure power case uh, when the order is not fast. So in that case, we will have uh, order, we will have modules that are not a direct sum of fraction ideas. So we need to improve on the module theoretic side if we want to use this model. Somehow it's interesting because I mean maybe we will see more with uh, Mark Kishmer's talk later. But we have also I mean our algorithm become very very slow when we have something which is far from being a maximal. Mm. And, um, yeah, and I really wonder I mean if like there would be a way I mean maybe we don't have exactly the same problems and the same procedures and it would be nice to see if one world can take advantage of the other somehow. So yeah, okay, yeah, but. Looking forward. Thanks. For the Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Other remarks or questions? If uh, not, then we will thank uh, Stefano again. We can clap. Thank you. 
So we have now a short break. We we'll resume at 8 p.m. Paris time. Uh, let me add, maybe it's a good time now to stretch, uh, stand. If you have stairs, you can walk down the stairs, walk up, do something physical because this Zoom thing is, uh, <laughs> is of course, a little bit uh, unnatural. So we we'll resume in seven minutes.